Here well, I think we're back. Uh, we've got a, a good group of people with us today. Um, I'd like you to uh, all make sure that you're muted. Um, but in the meantime, I'd like to thank you all for joining the Plan Mecca Digital Mastery Series. My name is Brad Fine, and I'm the uh, Regional Sales Manager for Plan Mecca USA. With us today is Becky Cole, and her topic is the first phase of the new world of dentistry. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. If you experience any technical issues, please submit your questions in the chat function. If you have questions for Becky, please submit them via the Q&A function at the bottom, and we'll do our best to answer them uh, at the end of the presentation. We anticipate this presentation will take about 60 minutes, and we will then open to questions. Additionally, we're recording the webinar and we'll send you the link early next week. At the end, there will be a post-webinar CE survey via the chat function, and we will also send an email directly to you early next week. In order to qualify for the continuing education verification, you will need to complete the survey. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Becky. You ready? You're on. I'm on, great. Thank you guys for coming tonight. Um, I know that um, some of us might want to be do doing other things on a Friday night, but um, I really hope you enjoy all the work um, that I've done over the last three weeks as far as updating things and the experiences that I've had in my practice over the last few weeks since we've gotten started. Um, I know that dentistry has been hard for us um, for the last couple of weeks. And I kind of want to talk about the things that we've experienced and some things that we can change in order to make things easier for us um, to continue to practice and give more confidence um, in working in uh, this time right now. So a little bit about myself. I am a dental hygienist. I've been a dental hygienist for about 18 years this May. Um, I am a mother of three children. My daughter will turn seven tomorrow. I have a three-year-old and I also have an eight-year-old. Um, I have been married for 10 years and I have had the opportunity to educate all over the world. And one of the places that I've been most often is in Japan. And it is one of my most favorite countries to visit. And I get the opportunity to educate all the dental hygienists out in Japan. I've been there about seven or eight times and I get to lecture and experience the culture. It's really been great. Um, I also bring dentists from Japan and we teach a, a hands-on cadaver course, placing dental implants, um, using actual cadaver heads, um, and learning and experience the anatomy with this course really has um, helped my dental hygiene career. I also have been a student. I like to travel the world and go to different courses. I had the opportunity to go to Sweden in June of last year and I attended a one week course in Malmo. I also um, has been, I have been an innovator. I de developed a dental product, I manufacturer, sold it, and now it's owned by a different company, Practicon. I'll talk about it actually later today. Um, I also am a CEO of a pharmaceutical company that sells products to Japan and then I am in training to be a research coordinator for our clinic um, in Omaha. So I've had so many amazing things happen in my life uh, as a dental hygienist, and I hope to continue to inspire hygienists in this field so that we can continue to feel confident working um, in this environment. So today we are going to talk, oh, I wanna introduce my clinic. So this is my new clinic. We built it and moved in there in December. And we really have been so lucky to have this new building in the situation that we are in. The building was built and we each have our own room. As you can see, I walked through the hallway in the clinic. That's the video there on the right. And we each have our own room with a door that can be shut. And in this situation, it's ideal in managing aerosols. And recently, he just installed a bipolar ionization um, system in our, uh, HEP, in our HVAC system. And we'll talk about that a little bit about trying to control aerosols and keeping the staff safe. So let's talk a little bit about how are we all doing right now? You know, I know that we are all scared and we are all struggling with, um, oh goodness, it's giving me typical, some technical difficulties here. Um, oh wow. 
Sorry, guys. It's warning me to close out of my screen. No. All right. Hold on. Sorry about this, guys. Give Looks me like a... you're starting to come back here, Becky. Yeah. Let's try this again. There we go. All right. Sorry about that, guys. Love technology. Anyway, so, um, you know, I know that we are all nervous right now and we're struggling with things and we're nervous to go back to work. We come home, we're stressed, we're exhausted, we're sore, we're tired. You know, sometimes we are unsure. Do we want to continue to do this? Can we continue to do this? Um, we're frustrated with maybe the environments we're working in. Um, and so what I'm hoping to do is just give you some um, more information to help us get through this. So if we really understood how this virus was transmitted, it would really make our lives a lot easier. If we knew for sure that aerosols were still infectious three hours um, while they're still sitting in the air, you know, we definitely know how we can manage that. But the thing is, is what we do know is we don't know. We don't really know, is an N95 and a level three mask necessary? Um, we know that the virus is very small. We know that this virus um, can penetrate many things. We know that we can be infected by asymptomatic um, patients. And so we just um, need to continue to study and continue to take these courses that we can continue to change the type of um, things that we do to stay safe. And so OSHA and the CDC really are the people that have been giving us guidance. And so one thing I want to point you guys to is if you are not feeling, um, if you are not feeling confident in, sorry about that, I don't know. Hey Becky, I'm sorry to interrupt you. You've got a, um, a screen there on the bottom right that says build order. Mm -hmm. to try and minimize that on your side. I'm trying here, let me get out of this. It's trying to, now it just went blank again. Oh, I see right here. Sorry about that. Get where we're at. There we go. Perfect. Right there. Okay. How's that? Is that better? Um, okay, so our OSHA is um, a place where we can go to help um, give us some guidance on some of the things that we need to do. And OSHA was really established to keep employees safe. And what we need to understand is according to OSHA, our employers are supposed to be providing our employees with an, a safe working environment. And so I encourage you guys to go to your OSHA site, to the OSHA.gov and really look at your rights as a hygienist or as an employee when it comes to working in a safe environment. So, in 1970, there was a act that was placed that says each employer shall furnish to each of its employees employment and place of employment, which are free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm to its employees. And so OSHA really will help guide you in determining what um, we need to do. And one thing that they really are recommending right now or saying that they're not going to give up on is making sure that we are developing a um, program if we're using our um, N95 masks. And what it is saying is we need to implement this program before we ever use um, our N95 masks. And as we all know, most of us probably have not in implemented the program. And what it's called is a respiratory protection program. And somebody in the office needs to be selected in order to implement that program. And there's many different elements of the program and it, it could be an entire Zoom conference about implementing this program. But there are some really good resources on the internet about doing that. Um, but really the program just sets forth some protocols for um, procedures when using your mask, training um, employees, the fit testing, giving um, and directing instructions on use for the um, respirators and cleaning and storing our respirators. And so 
that's something that I would recommend looking into. They are saying that if an office does not implement this um, respirator protection program and the OSHA comes in and evaluates the clinic, the clinic can be fined for not developing this program. And so after researching this and finding it out, we have begun to develop our program. And I do understand we didn't develop before we had our respirators, but these are just things that we're learning, but we can come up to code by knowing these things. So OSHA has provided different um, ways for us to eliminate or to provide a safe work environment. And this is the chart that they've kind of implemented. So we're gonna kind of walk through this chart and talk about the different things that we can do in order to keep ourselves safe. And so really the first one is elimination. And in the work environment that we're in, we can't really eliminate the risk that we're facing. COVID-19 is something that we can't just say, um, go away and um, remove infectious gases, just like if you're working in a warehouse. So this is something that we cannot eliminate. But what we can do um, by mitigating this is by screening our patients. So making sure we're asking our patients those questions um, in order to eliminate the risk of being exposed. And as far as substitution, I kept racking my brain, how we, can we substitute the risk? And in reality, we can't substitute the risk other than really only see patients on an emergency basis and don't see patients. Well, we all know that we're ready to get back to work and we're ready to continue to see patients. So as far as substitution, unfortunately, there's not a lot that we can um, employ in order to um, decrease risk. But other things that we can do is some engineering controls. And those engineering, engineering controls include um, changing things like isolate the issue, like providing HEPA filters or UV light or hypochlorous acid or ionization in our HVAC systems. And then as far as administrative control, what we can do is changing the way that we work. And that is not polishing and not cavitroning our patients. And so those are things that we can do to change to decrease our risk. And last, um, our personal protective equipment really is the last resort to decrease our risk. So let's talk about some of these just a little bit more. So as far as screening our patients, I'm sure that all of you are screening your patients. And I've had a couple experiences with screening patients so far. Um, and one of them is, let me give you a couple of stories that I've had this week. And screening our patients is really not 100%. I'm sure that you all are finding this out. Um, for instance, I had a patient who works in a warehouse and he answered no to all of the questions on our um, screen. And after working on him for about 30 minutes, I continued to ask him questions, seeing how he was doing. And I asked him, I said, so do you know anybody who has the virus? And he says, oh yeah, my mom has it and my sister has it and my niece has it. Oh, and some friends from work have the virus. And I sit and all of a sudden I stop and I think, okay, I'm pretty sure he answered no to all of those questions. But here I am talking to him only to find out that yes, he does know somebody who has the virus. But after questioning him and spending some more time really talking with him, we understood that he, swore he'd never been exposed to those patients or to those people. So, you know, having all the other safety guards in place is really important to prevent us, even if he had been exposed. The second was um, this patient, she is an, uh, studying to become an ENT and she's working on her on an ambulance. And she was talking about, you know, we don't have very many um, uh, protection. We don't have much for a mask. All we have is like a surgical grade three and that's it when it comes to working with patients. And she said, I transported a patient for two hours. And once I got to the hospital, I was yelled at by the nurses because they said, you don't have the PPE you need. This is a possibly positive COVID patient. And I'm sitting here thinking, okay, she knew she was possibly exposed to that patient. She answered no to that question. And we know for sure that she possibly was exposed. And so these are some things that we just have to ask our question, patient questions. One thing that we've now implemented is we kind of question our patients about, has your work environment caused you to be exposed to possible COVID patients? Because I think some people don't even consider that as a possible exposure. 
But something else that we need to kind of inform our patients about, and if we're calling our patients and we're asking them these questions, one thing that's good to do is tell our patients that if they're waiting in the cars before they come in, that they need to sit in their cars with the air conditioning on. Many times I've had my patients come in and they've had 99, 99.9 .9 degree fevers because they sat in the car for 15 minutes without air conditioning on. And so they're hot and now they come in, they have a fever and you're questioning, okay, you have kind of a high fever. We know the cutoff is 100.4, but it starts to make you feel a little bit concerned. And so something we've asked is our patients to sit with the air conditioner on to prevent that. So um, just something to kind of remember. And also if your patient comes in and they do have a higher fever, what you can say to them is, and if you have the time in this space, you can say, okay, I'm gonna have you sit in the air conditioning. We're gonna give it some time. We're gonna retake your temperature. And if it's, if it's going down, that we know that the heat outside is what has caused you to have um, that temperature today. So what happens if we have a patient um, who um, was exposed to COVID-19, okay? And they haven't had a test, they don't have um, any, you know, any symptoms or anything like that, but they were exposed to somebody who does have symptoms, somebody who might have a fever, somebody who had a cough, or somebody with a sore throat and loss of taste. They are saying that these people may need to be quarantined longer than somebody who actually was tested positive for COVID-19. So they recommend that these patients would quarantine themselves for 14 days, and then you can reschedule them for an appointment. And then what about our patients who test positive um, for COVID-19, but they've recovered? And it's very interesting, the test, you know, it's not 100%. There are many um, false, neg or false negatives and false positives for COVID-19, um, but the, the tests are just not specific enough. And so if a patient is tested, even six weeks after they had the virus, they can still test positive. And the reason is, is because these tests are not sensitive enough to determine whether or not they, when they detect the RNA of the virus in the sample, they can't determine whether or not the, the virus is dead or if it's alive. So they still can possibly detect the RNA particle. So they're saying that these patients can um, uh, shed the virus for up to 28 days. And so if you have a patient that's still testing positive, even six weeks after what you can do, or even four weeks after my recommendation is just making sure that you don't see the patients unless it's 28 days, because they're saying that's kind of the golden time as far as when the, um, they continue to shed that virus. So what about our patients who are, have been positive for COVID-19? Um, how do we determine when it's time to let them out of isolation, when it's time to, it's okay to see them in the clinics? And so the CDC put some guidelines down on different types of strategies you can use in order to see these patients. So let's say we have a patient who has COVID-19 and they're um, under isolation, but these patients um, demonstrated symptoms. So there's a couple ways that we can um, determine when it's okay to see the patient. And they describe it as two different types of um, screening the patients. And one is the symptom-based strategy, and then we also have a test-based strategy. And so what that means is with a symptom-based strategy, you want to wait um, at least three days um, since they've recovered and they are not using any fever-reducing medications to um, reduce their fever. And so as long as that's the case and it's symptom-based, then, um, and it also has to be 10 days since, let's see, 10, since day, 10 days, 10 days have passed since the first symptoms appeared. So that's your symptom-based strategy. So a test-based strategy would be if the patient tests positive, they also cannot be using medication just to decrease their fever, but also with a test-based strategy, strategy they would have to have two negative tests, but the tests have to be 24 hours apart from each other. And then they also have to go 10 days um, since um, they have to have their respiratory symptoms have at least um, improved for that test-based strategy. And so if they fall under all those categories, 
then they're saying based on the CDC that they can be seen. So what if we have a positive COVID-19 patient without symptoms? Well, it's a little bit different on how we um, would see these patients or the strategy would we use. They recommend using a time-based strategy. And what they're saying with that is um, they have to have go at least 10 days since the last positive test and also 10 days um, since their first symptoms appeared. But in that 10 days, if the, during that time the symptoms develop, then you're gonna go back and look at that test-based strategy or the symptom-based strategy to determine whether or not you can see the patient. So we have our COVID-19 patients who are showing symptoms and our COVID-19 patients who are not showing symptoms. And so you're gonna kind of manage them a little bit differently. And what was interesting to me that just came out, it was a uh, beginning of this week, the WHO came out and said, oh, so asymptomatic patients cannot spread the virus. And it was all over the national news. And then I went back and I researched it because I said, well, I really need to know whether or not this is the case. And after doing research, they retracted some of that information saying that yes, an asymptomatic patient can expose and still cause um, the virus. So it's always good if we hear information about this virus, we go back and research it for ourselves. So we really know and make sure um, what the information that they're telling us is right. Okay, so we all have kind of different patients we're seeing on our clinic. And one of the patients that I tend to see, about 15% of my patients are my high-risk patients. And so with these high-risk patients, um, I know my patients pretty well, and I go through my schedule ahead of time, and, I'm, and I look at these patients, and I go, you know, I know this patient's diabetic. I know this patient has, um, is obese, and I know this patient's on um, high blood pressure medications. And so what I will do is typically I'll reschedule these patients um, in the morning where my office I know is clear from as many aerosols as possible because it's had a chance to settle overnight. And so I get to work out of two separate rooms, two separate isolation rooms. So I will schedule them one at nine o'clock and one at 10 o'clock in a room that hasn't been used. Now I have a lot of other protocols that would allow me to continue to see the patients through the day, but I know this makes me feel the most comfortable and I can make them feel more confident about it when we do it this way. And then we have these patients that are completely unaware about the risk that they face. They are completely unaware that the risk that we face is dental hygienists. And so I make sure that I educate my patients about all the new protocols that we've set forth in the office to keep them safe. Um, I want them to know that I'm spending my time to protect them and we're spending time to protect our staff and to protect patients that are after them. And I think most of the time, I'm surprised to see that most of my patients are unaware, um, specifically my young ones. Like I had an 18 year old that said, came in and said, I don't care, I'm 18, I'm young, I'll be fine, it's not a problem. And so just making sure to educate them and let them know, you know, I'm at risk here and these are the reasons I'm at risk, but these are the things we're doing to protect myself and these are the things that I'm doing to protect you. And then we have those patients that are aware. I had a patient come in the other day and she had shoe coverings on and she had a mask on and she had gloves on and she had a head covering and she probably used my hand sanitizer 10 times before I even put her in the chair. And these patients are very nervous and rightfully so. Most of the time these patients usually have um, other things such as um, you know, all of the other comorbidities that could be associated with this disease or they're elderly. And so with these patients, before you even have a chance to tell them what you are doing to protect them, you, they've usually already asked you. And so I just reinforce and tell them all the, the things that I've um, implemented in the practice in order to keep them safe. And then we have our patients that are angry. And I've only had a few patients that have come in and they're annoyed by the fact that I asked them to use hand sanitizer. Or they're annoyed by the fact that I asked them to rinse their mouth with a, you know, with a mouthwash for a minute. And I just have to spend my time educating them and letting them know why I'm doing it and why we're doing it and tell them it's not just about protecting you. I have to protect the other patients and the staff in my office. So, so what are some of the engineering so that would be our next step down on that um, 
hierarchy, the chart that the CDC set. And so some of the engineering goal, um, controls that we can do, you know, as hygienists, we are limited in the fact that most of us, 95% of us don't own our own practice. And so it really limits what we can do in order to protect ourselves. And so um, some of the engineering controls that um, they recommend is having individual rooms. Well, if your office was built and you don't have individual rooms, there's nothing you can do about it, um, short of going in and building new walls. Um, but what we do, you know, other things we can do is if our chairs are six feet apart, if that's something we can change or alter, or at least use every other chair in order to provide the distance there. Also, physical barriers. So the CDC recommended that we install barriers between rooms that are open concepts. So they would want a barrier that um, goes from the floor to the ceiling um, in order to prevent that cross-contamination of aerosols. But one thing they did recommend is making sure that if we installed that and we have sprinklers in our system, in our office, that we wouldn't want that to interrupt the effectiveness of that. And then, um, Operators. Operators should be oriented parallel to the airflow. We don't want the airflow crossing us and going and bringing all of the air from the aerosol from the room way on the end to the aerosol clear to the other end um, in the office. And so if you can reorient the chairs just a little bit to make the airflow um, different, that's, that would be an option as well. But one thing recently, so it was June 3rd, um, the CDC put out some new guidelines. They did a webinar. It was about an hour and 30 minutes long. And some of the things I picked out of there, the biggest one that I noticed was they recommend that we leave our room sit for 15 minutes after we see the patient so that the aerosols are able to dissipate from the room. And so it's more those heavier aerosols, the droplets, the droplets that tend to drop quicker and closer to the chair. The ones that are really light and up in the air, no matter if we wait 15 minutes, we'd have to wait three hours for those to really dissipate. But controlling some of the aerosol and minimizing it before you go back in the room um, to clean it up, and that's what they recommend. Now, I understand the concept of waiting 15 minutes before you could actually um, have the opportunity um, to you know, do that. You have to wait 15 minutes your doctor's going to tell you, well, if you waited 15 minutes, you saw eight patients in um, a day, that would be two hours that you are not producing. And so I understand that that's an issue. It, these are just guidelines. These are guidelines set by the CDC. If they can be followed, it's highly recommended. So other things that we can do to, as far as engineering controls, are installing um, different things like HEPA filters, um, increasing the ventilation during our working hours, which would mean if you can turn the HVAC system from the fan being on auto to the HVAC system where the fan is always on. That's one recommendation that I had heard. Also, the fans inside your bathrooms, you want to have those running at all times. You don't want them to be turning on and off because if you have a patient that's in the bathroom and they sneeze or they cough and the fan turns off after they've left the room, there's a risk for exposure or cross-contamination there. Um, sneeze guards, I think everywhere you go, you tend to see um, um, sneeze guards. So you just kind of want to um, put that in. It's very inexpensive, um, but it protects the patient and it protects you front staff. Negative pressure rooms, obviously this is very expensive to do and it's not something that you are able to do. All right, and then the ionization in the HVAC system. So if you can do, um, this is less expensive than the negative pressure rooms, um, and it's really effective. And we're gonna talk more about all of these things. And then the hypochlorous acid foggers, this is an amazing product. Um, I'm very excited about it, and I think it's a very affordable thing for hygienists to implement on their own if their um, employers aren't able to do it. And then also the UVC lights in order to sterilize the room. So let's talk about um, HEPA filters. Um, HEPA filters, they, in order to be considered a HEPA filter, it has to follow some different recommendations. And one of it is, is it has to filter 99.97% um, of particles, 0.3 microns in diameter. 
So if you go back and you think about it, the N95 mask is the same thing. They are tested at the same standard where they have 99 point, the N95 says it does 95% of 0.3 microns um, from the HEPA filter. So um, they are effective in removing the virus. Um, but like I said, they're not all treated the same. And from the research that I've done, this Winix brand, this is a brand that can be bought at Costco. It can be bought anywhere between about $250 to $350. Um, so it's something that as a hygienist, if you wanted that protection, you could purchase it on your own and bring it to your um, clinic. And But the Winix has what's called a plasma wave um, technology. And what that does is it uses electrons to attract the virus and kill the virus before it goes through the HEPA filter. And Winix is one of the few um, brands that have that. We have mostly Winix in our practice, but then a couple sharp. And the I asked to have the Winix filters put in my room and I removed the sharp HEPA filters because this filter is more effective in killing the virus. We also have what is called the Pico and it's photoelectron electrochemical oxidation. This is a little bit more expensive of the filtration system. Um, it's going to run anywhere between $800 and $1,500, but it's able to um, kill viruses that are 100 times smaller than what the HEPA filter filtrates. It's a little bit more expensive, um, but it's also another option. It's be a very effective way to bring it into your operatory where it would be safe um, and not risk the issues of what like a UV light would um, cause. And then some things to understand when you're using your HEPA filters, you want to make sure that you're running them on high and not on auto. The, the Winix has an option to run auto and the first thing I do is I turn it up all to high. It is one of the louder um, HEPA filters, but um, I think the risk and just talking a little bit louder to my patient is important. But the other thing is making sure we're not putting our HEPA filters behind us. And the reason that is, is because the HEPA filter is going to draw that air from the patient through you to behind you. So when you take your HEPA filter, you want to place that to the side of you. So it draws all the aerosol and the air away from you and away from your patient. So UVC lights. Um, these are very effective in um, sterilizing the air. And the only thing is the issue is if you are not able to turn it on and leave the room, it can't be used when you're in the room. It, it's very dangerous to the skin. It's very dangerous to the eyes. And if you have a live plant in your room, it will surely kill it. Um, so it also kills the viruses in the air, but it does not remove the virus once it's killed it. So the particles in the air remain. Also, the limitation with the UVC light is the UVC light, if there are any shadows, um, it does not kill the virus if it can't reach it. So you want to use it when you use it. I tend to put it in one part of the room, turn it on for 10 minutes, and then I move it to another part of the room, but I move it lower and put it on for another 10 minutes. Something else that I've noticed with this is when I go into the room, there is a small burnt odor. Uh, and what that is, is basically it's killing the particles and burning the particles in the air. But I also, with my HEPA filter, have able to quickly clear that out of the room. And uh, ever since we placed the bipolar ionization in our HVAC system, we haven't been dealing with that smell as much. But this is the um, UVC light that we purchased. It was about $350. For the size of my room, it needs to go for about 13 minutes. And so what I do is I run it for 10 minutes in one spot of the room and then run it for 10 minutes on the other side of the room and move it. Um, this is um, by Q, Cure UV. And so this is another something that you could put into um, your operatories in order to um, clean it, maybe after lunch. And then that would give you the ability to get rid of some of the aerosol, aerosols and decrease the amount of uh, con contaminants in the air. Okay, so hypochlorous acid is very interesting. And I kept looking at all those, um, the national news always had people in hazmat suits and they were going up and down the cities and they were using um, a mist and they were going through 
railways and they were going through public areas and they were um, going through airplanes. And I was like, what could this possibly be? And how can that be safe to be spraying this chemical all over everything? Well, it's hypochlorous acid. And hypochlorous acid is actually produced naturally in our body after a cell uh, eats a virus. What it does is produces hypochlorous acid and it kills the virus. That's how our body works. And so it's a very natural product. Um, it is a neutral pH. It's about a neutral pH of six. And they say it's about 70 to 80% stronger than bleach. And it's not as caustic. So you're not going to discolor things like the, um, um, it's, you, it doesn't bleach chairs. It doesn't bleach floors. It doesn't change things like that. Um, what it does is it's an oxidizer. And so um, it attaches itself to the virus and kills it. So a little bit more about um, hypochlorous acid. What's nice is when a virus is on a surface, what happens is it's negatively charged and hypochlorous acid is attracted to that. So when it is sprayed over the surface, instead of pooling in one area, it's drawn all over to where the virus is and then it kills the virus because of the electron attraction. Um, it's relatively inexpensive. It's basically, um, you can buy this machine and you use table, saw, table salt and you put it in there and with the electrical current that goes through it creates this acid. And um, it's about, this machine is about $350. Um, I purchased one for my home because I'm able to um, clean my food, my vegetables, I'm able to sanitize things in my home without worrying about all those harsh chemicals in the home. Um, the only thing you have to be careful about is if you have a metal that's not protected, it can cause rusting. Um, but these fogger systems, you can see them where they're kind of battery powered and they'll spray it all over the room, or they're more like a pumping system and they can be sprayed in the room. But this works very quickly. As soon as it touches the surface or the virus, it kills it. And so the contact time, when you're talking about disinfection, the contact time is very low. Um, so it will clean it instead of like our cabicide wipes, which takes, we need a contact time of at least two to three minutes, depending on the brand that you have. Um, this only takes within seconds. Um, it's about 30 seconds that it needs to be in contact. And so it floats up in the air, attracts itself to the virus, and then kills it. The other thing is, is it doesn't have to be um, rinsed off. So other things that we can do that they've set forth is some administrative controls. And what is that? That's changing the way that we practice. And as hygienists, I don't think that we ever thought that we would go back to the old ages of scaling um, without instruments and hand scaling. And it's something that I know all of us have struggled with. I'm on Facebook and I read questions all the time and everybody keeps saying, I just don't know how I'm gonna continue to do this. I don't know how I'm gonna hand scale these patients. And I really don't feel like, I don't feel confident that I'm giving my patients a standard of care. And what I can say to you is, if you have the right instruments and you um, increase your skill, According to studies, it has said that we can be as effective and provide the same services um, and the outcomes to our patients, whether or not we're using hand scalers or whether or not we are using um, ultrasonics. This was a study done, and the study talked about the use of hand instruments, so the comparison between hand instruments, the ultrasonic, and the piezo. And they brought these patients back um, over a course of three different times, and as you can see on the diagram, the outcomes and the results were very similar for each group. So we can provide the same care that our patients need. Um, it's just going to take more time and we have to be more meticulous about it. Um, the other issue is, you know, are we flushing out the pockets with the ultra, you know, like the ultrasonic does? And no, we are not providing that lavage of the tissues, but we still are able to disrupt the bacteria and disrupt the biofilm. You also have to remember that studies say that the ultrasonic can cause some roughness to the root surface, and it causes more roughness than the hand instruments. So removing the calculus with a hand instrument is, can give us a really great outcome. When I teach um, scaling a root planning in Japan, I teach a, a a system where we scale ultrasonic and then go back and scale because we want to smooth the surface. 
But in order to make it through this, we need to have instruments that are going to provide us um, with the best possible outcome. And I know there's some inc incidences where we have pockets that are narrow and we have pockets that are very deep. And that's where we would have used our ultrasonic. We have, we have furcations that we can't get our instruments in and we can't use our working stroke and we can't engage our blade. But there are instruments out there that are made in order to help us get those areas. And LM is an instrument. I've switched all of my um, hand instruments to LM. Like I said, I had the opportunity to go to Sweden last year and I was introduced to these instruments. When I came home from Sweden, I replaced all of the instruments that I had and bought all of LM's instruments. They are um, diamond coated and they do not need to be sharpened. They are so sharp. And using these instruments, I can tell you that over the last two weeks, I thought to myself multiple times, I could not be doing this if I didn't have the proper instruments. I work in a perio clinic, I work there two days a week, and my patients are, I see patients that were sent to us because they couldn't handle them in a regular clinic. And so these in instruments have given me really the confidence to know that I'm treating my patients with that standard of care that they deserve. And so I'm gonna talk about a couple, about a couple instruments that I have been using um, where I would have um, used an ultrasonic. So the first instrument is the LM Ho. Um, this is a lateral hole. This is a pocket that I worked on. I did a full mouth scaling of root planning on this patient. Um, he had a nine millimeter pocket right there on number six. It's a very narrow pocket. It was a very deep pocket. And he had a large piece of calculus at the very base of that pocket. And so this is where I implemented that LM, um, the Ho. And so you can see um, how I use this instrument. I was able to, my video is not going. Oh, I hope it didn't freeze. Yep, it froze for a second. That's the disadvantage of putting videos in your um, presentations. Um, but I was able, you're able to take this instrument and drop it all the way to the pocket, engage the blade, and then, well, you'll see it. This was my 15, 16. I'm sorry, the last video didn't show. Um, but I was able to move it all the way to the base of the pocket and engage the blade and clean the entire root surface. I was able to clean all the way from the mesial of that pocket, all the way to the distal of that pocket. And then the next thing I did is I switched to my 1516 um, Gracie. And the reason why I moved to that Gracie is because it has a very long um, shank, but the blade is very small. And so I'm able to um, get it into areas where I couldn't have used my regular Gracie or even some of my other instruments. And when I purchase these instruments in my Perio kit, I have 11, 12, 13, 14, and then I brought in the 15, 16, 17, 18 because I deal with pockets on a routine basis that are deeper than six millimeters. And when I went to purchase them, they said, well, the only thing we have in the black diamond is a 15, 16, but it's a mini. And I was a little bit nervous about buying it that way, but I thought, you know what? I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna see how things go. And I'll be honest, I use my 15, 16 and my 17, 18 mini Gracie more than I'm using my 11, 12, um, 13, 14, just because it is so small and it's so agile. I can move it into all those little pockets um, where the 11, 12 or the 13, 14 might seem a little bit bulky. And so, and the sharpness of these instruments, um, being able to feel calculus with an instrument and not having to pick up um, a Explorer that is one of the greatest things that um, I've really enjoyed with these instruments. And then the grip. I have been doing this for 18 years and I can tell you that over the last um, year, I had started seeing a chiropractor for some carpal tunnel symptoms. And after starting to use this instrument, um, these instruments with, this, with the grip, I've been able to um, have a lot more relief, especially after doing full mouth scaling or root planings that take me two, two and a half hours. So they're great instruments as far as the tactile sensitivity. Um, the other one is, is these diamond coated um, files for furcations. I don't know if anybody has used the ultrasonic tip with the diamond coats on them. Um, 
those are awesome and they remove all that really heavy um, tenacious calculus and of course now that we don't get to use that we've got to have an alternative and these um, frication files are amazing so these frication files have little diamonds on them which gives you thousands of cutting edges which allows you to use these instruments at any position, at any stroke, any direction that you need to in order to access a pocket that's really deep, um, difficult to access. Um, I didn't have a chance to use these instruments on a patient, um, so I used my type in, in order to show you the ways that I use this instrument. I'll take the instrument and turn it and flip it a completely different direction in order to access vocations. Um, I have many patients that we see in our clinic um, that uh, many patients in our clinic that have these distal pockets on the second molars from having uh, wisdom teeth extractions that have caused um, some bony defects back there. And I'm dealing constantly with those vocation issues. And this instrument has really become a lifesaver for me. Um, I can access these pockets. I can use, um, like I said, circumferential movements. I can use lateral movements. And my periodontist that I work for, he started implementing them in, in his um, RRS surgery. He came out of it the other day and he was like, I don't think I've done that great of a job hand scaling in my lifetime. And so he really enjoys using these instruments as well. So I would encourage you guys to look into them, um, especially during this time when we're not using the ultrasonic and we need to access these pockets and keep them clean. So as far as aerosols, so we're not using our ultrasonic instruments because of aerosols. The aerosols being produced in the air, they can last for up to three hours um, and really can you know, cause issues for um, patients who might be susceptible that walk in our rooms after a patient who could be possibly positive for COVID. But I understand the reality. And the reality is we have those patients that have calculus that is hard and there's no way we're removing it with our hand instrument and they come in and it looks like they hadn't been to the dentist in 30 years and you clean their teeth every three months. I have those patients. And so if you're planning on implementing the ultrasonic, something that needs and must be done is the use of the high volume evacuation system in order to manage those aerosols. And there's lots of different products on the market in order to help manage those um, aerosols. Um, Mr. Thirsty, we have Relief, we have New Bird, we have PureVac. But something to keep in mind is the bore size, which means the end of the high volume evacuation tool has to be eight millimeters in order to be um, effective in removing aerosols. And so some of these products, um, I have seen journals and articles about the effectiveness of re removing aerosols. And we're finding that they really don't. And I know some of these, I've seen videos about some of them coming back and saying, you know, they do, and they show videos of them removing aerosols. Um, I think it's important for you to judge yourself and do the research for them. But this is gonna give you some options in order to um, use the ultrasonic if you have to, but implement that high, vo high volume evacuation. But the product that you see up on the right hand Corner. This is called the Ergo Finger. This finger is only available. This ob, uh, product is only available in Europe right now. Um, I found this product when I was in Japan um, four years ago, and I spoke with these girls about bringing the product to the United States. And four years ago, they weren't ready for it. Um, the product up there on the left hand side, this is called the EProp. I invented this product back in 2002. You can purchase it now, and it's owned by Practicon. And so I've had the experience of um, developing a product and bringing it into the market and bringing it into the United States. And so um, I am in the works with this company right now. Um, it's called the Ergo Finger and bringing it to the United States. And so this is a product that is gonna make our lives so much easier when it comes to implementing um, high volume evacuation if you are um, doing ultrasonic. I am not using the ultrasonic right now, but I am polishing now. And so I use it during my polishing procedures in order to manage the aerosol and the spatter coming off of my profi angle. And so um, I would love for everybody to go and um, follow our page. We will be bringing this to the United States and it should be available hopefully around August. 
So personal protective equipment, like I told you, this is the very bottom of that triangle about keeping us safe. And so the biggest thing that I've noticed about our PPE is every one of us is really struggling with the effects of wearing an N95 mask. And I thought to myself, am I really causing myself harm by wearing this mask? Because when I put it on, I feel horrible. Within minutes, I start to get a headache. And within minutes, I start to feel sick and nauseous and short of breath. And so I started to do research. And the research that I did was a study. Of course, my screen is um, frozen again. But there was a study done. And what it, uh, the study was done on um, ICU nurses who were wearing N95 masks for 12 hours. Okay, And what they wanted to know, okay, what are the physiological effects that these nurses are having and really is it causing them to have issues with carbon monoxide um, saturation issues and so they tested the patient they tested they tested the nurses at the very beginning of their um, shift and then they test the nurses at the very end of the shift and what they found is the saturation went from about a 32 to a 41 after a 12-hour shift and there is an increase in the CO2, but they call that not a physiological risk. In order to have a physiological risk, the levels would have had to been 45. And when I look at that, I think, man, we are only a few points off of um, really having a level of carbon monoxide in our system that would be considered toxic. And so something else that they looked at was the compliance of using an N95. Or do, are these nurses struggling with more symptoms if they're putting a um, surgical mask over the N95? And the answer is yes. These nurses were experiencing all these subjective symptoms and they were experiencing more fatigue and they were experiencing um, some of the things that we have all been facing. And so it just goes to show that what we are having, this is real. These are real symptoms that we are facing. And so we kind of have to think about how do we manage working with these N95s. Um, some of the things, the subjective symptoms um, that they were reviewing were that, um, you know, difficulty breathing, di difficulty taking in breath. Um, some other things that they were um, testing is perceived exertion. Like, do you feel like you're working harder even though you're not? Does your heart rate increase? Are you getting lightheaded? Um, are you struggling with communication? I know I feel like I have a brain fog all day long when I'm working with my patients and have a hard time really expressing to my patients what I want to express to them. And everybody is facing this right now. So what I did was I said, okay, oh, sorry, this was another study, I'm sorry. So this is done by the RDH magazine. And what the RDH magazine found out is when we have increased CO2 levels, then these are some of the things that start to happen to us. And it's, we wanna know why are we having, why are we so tired when we leave work? And one of the things that they found is when our CO2 levels go up, our body's way of compensating for that is increasing our heart rate. So now when we're at work, not only are we working, but now our heart rate's higher. So basically it's like um, doing fast paced walking throughout the office when you're not even moving because your heart rate is increased. So of course you're going to be more tired and exhausted when you leave the day. I'm hoping that just like a swimmer, when we swim and we train without oxygen, that our bodies tend to get used to it. As swimmers, we are able to um, teach our bodies to work in that, to, to have stress in that environment. And I'm hoping that with time, that as we're using these masks, we start to develop that and our bodies calm down and some of these symptoms um, improve. So, um, like they said, these respirators are causing a difficulty in oxygen exchange. The symptoms that we're facing, they are very real. And so, do we really have to wear an N95? Do, is that something that we really must have on? And the study that was done um, to detect the aerosols that are present um, in the air, and they wanted to determine what are the areas that are most exposed. And unfortunately, the masks um, that are most contaminated 
when they did this study. So right here where we're breathing in and any of that air that is drawn to our face is what is causing um, um, our mask to be contaminated. And so when I think about, well, do I really have to wear an N95 and a surgical mask? And then I read this article, I'm thinking, I kind of feel like that's something I need to do. And like I said at the very beginning, what we do know is we don't know. And so until then, we will mitigate the risk and I recommend wearing these masks. So how can we use these masks? The CDC describes two different types of using the mask and what they call it is extended use and reuse, reuse use, okay, or reuse. And so extended is where we basically put our mask on, we wear it all day long, or we wear it up until lunch, we take it off, put it back on, and then wear it till the end of the day. That's what they call extended use. It is a recommended way of using it as far as contamination goes, because it requires us to uh, adjust the mask more often. It, it, we don't um, touch our mask as often. Um, and so that was why they recommended more the extended use than the reuse. What you reuse means is we take it off between every single patient we put it back on. What we need to understand is if we are reusing our mask, we need to always make sure that every time we put that mask back on, it's still functioning the way that it's supposed to. You have to remember the straps that we are putting over our heads, just like a rubber band that's going to get stretched out over time. So the tension that that mask is gonna have on your face and the seal that you're gonna have is gonna be decreased every time you, you stretch out that um, mask. Um, and every time you use it, hand hygiene should be done before and hand hygiene should be done after if you're putting it on and taking it off. And when you're not using it, these um, masks should be stored in a place where it's not touching any other object or any other object is touching it. And they recommend a brown paper bag because it is more of a breathable surface. So when do we dispose of our masks? When is it time to get rid of them? And when is it time to um, uh, store them? So as far as discarding our mask, anytime that you use an N95 and you produce aerosols, they recommend that you get rid of the N95 or put it in a UV sterilization um, center. And in my clinic, that's what we have. We have a UV sterilization. And if I take my mask off at lunch, then I put it in there. Um, and also if an N95 ever becomes contaminated with blood or any other respiratory secretions, so for example, you're working on a patient and, the, and you get blood on it, then it needs to be um, thrown away. But what we also need to understand is let's say we're wearing our mask and we have a runny nose and we get the mask wet, then that N95 also needs to be disposed of. And that's why they recommend wearing the mask over it is so that we can um, increase how many, um, making sure that we're not just throwing away N95s because of the supply issue. Um, and then if you have an N95 mask on and you are exposed to a patient who is positive for COVID-19, um, they recommend disposing of the um, N95 mask. When this was all at the peak and we had the nurses working in New York and it was the only option they had and there was not enough N95s to dispose of, you know, it caused a really big scare for these nurses. And I'm hoping that soon our supply changes and then if we are exposed to a person, we can discard them or at least have enough N95 that if we're exposed, that N95 can also be stored in a UV light. And then if we're storing our respirators, we need to make sure that our um, respirators are stored in a breathable bag. Um, we do not want them touching anything else and we do not want them touching each other. And so a really neat um, way that I saw that they disposed or they um, stored their bags was if you get like a birthday bag and they have the um, handles on them, you take it and you place it, you place the, the band of the N95 over the handle and then you let the mask fall into the bag and then it's protected by the bag from anything touching it or it teach, touching anything else. And as far as um, if we're storing our mask and we're taking on, we're taking off, you want to make sure that we're washing our hands anytime that you touch the outside of the mask. Or when you're having extended use and you adjust your mask, always make sure that you're washing your hands or you're changing your gloves. 
Um, and something I forgot to mention, if you're reusing your mask, always make sure the same person is reusing the same mask. It's not a good idea for if you have a mask, you put it in the UV light, and then after lunch, everybody just goes and grabs the mask out of the UV light. Everybody should have their own mask that is labeled for them and only used by them. So when I started putting all this PPE on, I thought, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this and do it right and not self-contaminate myself? And so what I had to do is I had to create a system for myself. And I had to implement this system. And it's a system that I have to use every time I put it on and every time I take it off so that I know that I'm not contaminating myself or contaminating my um, PPE. And so this is the system that I created based on doing research from other recommendations. Um, and so this is what I do. I wash my hands and then I put on my isolation gown. We have, a, we have washable isolation gowns and for every patient, I change my isolation gown and I change my um, head covering. And so I put on my isolation gown and then I put on my N95 mask. And I put that on before I put on my hair cap because I'm, I use, I keep my N95 mask on from when I get there until after lunch. And so if I'm taking off my head cap, then I would have to take my N95 off every time I take off my cap. And then I place a surgical mask over top of that. Then I place my goggles and my shield. I wash my hands and then I put my gloves on. And that's the system that I use in order to um, put my PPE on. Now, putting our masks on, we know that the respiratory protection program, they are saying we really need to um, have a fit test. Well, we all know that we are not getting our fit tests. Um, and so what they recommend is if you don't have a fit test is to test and see if your masks are actually working properly. And so what you wanna do is you wanna um, perform a negative positive seal check. And what that means is you wanna put your N95 in on, you wanna make sure that it's up against your nose properly, and then it goes all the way around your chin. Um, the other day I had an issue with air escaping from the bottom, and all I had to do was adjust the strap in order to get a better seal. And then you wanna take a breath in and out. Are you feeling any air on the outside of your face? Are you feeling any air in your, in your nose or on your chin? And then you also want to take some small breaths and you want to see the mask kind of come in and come out. Now, the first video I showed you was an N95 mask that I had. And the second video I'm showing you is a KN95 mask that I have. And the N95 mask has a, has a thicker material. So when you breathe in and out, you're not going to see it move as much as the KN95 that I'm wearing in this video. But that just gives you a good idea of whether or not you're getting that seal in order for it to draw in the material. Um, and you also want to make sure that if you continue to reuse those masks, that they want to be breathable. And if you notice the amount of oxygen decreasing from the horrible amount of oxygen you're getting to start with, but if it continues to get worse, this means that this um, mask needs to be um, replaced. So that's a good, another way of saying, okay, it's time to get rid of this mask. Now, as far as um, um, removing my PPE, this is the step that I do. Um, so after I'm done seeing a patient, I first remove my gloves and put on a new set of gloves. I remove my shield, my surgical cap, uh, or surgical mask, I'm sorry, my cap, and then my gown. And then I remove those gloves. And what I leave on all day long is I leave my goggles on and I leave my N95 mask on. And with every new patient, every patient that I see, I have a new gown, I have a head, new head covering, and I have a new surgical mask. And so that's the system I've created for removing my PPE to know that I'm not contaminating myself. So I recommend that you guys establish a system like this and I recommend that you um, practice it the other thing is it tends to make things go a little bit quicker when you've established that program. And so changing the PPE between patients goes quite a bit faster um, when you've developed that program. And so this is just something that I've um, done. And I think it's helped me a lot um, in dealing with these PPE. And I know what it's like to have all this PPE on. And I know the stresses that we're facing right now 
um, really challenge whether or not um, we can do this all the time. And I think that over time, you know, we're going to find out that maybe an N95 is not, we don't have to wear an N95, or we're going to find out, you know, we're going to get a rapid test and we'll be able to test our patients prior to them coming in. We can go back to our surgical masks and we can go back to the things that we knew. But some things, just like when HIV came out in 1980, may never change. Nobody ever went back to not wearing gloves and nobody ever went back to not wearing a mask. And now we think of it now when we think there is no way that I would go back and practice dental hygiene without the without gloves or without a mask. And so I hope tonight I've given you guys kind of um, a handle on some of the stuff that we're facing in this new age of dentistry. I know it's changing and I know it's scary and I know it's hard, um, but we just have to continue to educate ourselves and continue to challenge the things that we're hearing and stand up for what we believe in and stand up for wanting to have the protection that we need. And even if you have to implement some of that stuff yourself, I'm hoping that I give you some ideas that are you know, pretty affordable. I would say most of them, the HEPA filters, the hypochlorous acid, the UV lights, they're under $400. And so if you can invest in these things for yourself, um, just to provide um, safety for you. So thank you for joining me on a Friday night. Um, I know that I'm gonna go and draw myself a glass of wine after this. So hopefully you guys can too, and we'll open it up to some questions. Amazing job, Becky. Um, there's been a few people that have raised their hands. Uh, it looks like most questions have been answered through. Uh, but if you have a question, uh, please post it here to the question and answer uh, function uh, and or raise your hand and I will open it up. Uh, before I do so, please note that I've uh, put the link to the survey for CE in the chat fun function uh, as well as the AGD code. Uh, these will be emailed to you as well as the recording uh, early next week. Uh, right out of the gate, we have a couple people that have questions. I'm going to start with Patricia, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. Patricia, can you hear us? Yeah. You're live. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to know where um, do you buy the thing that makes the HLCL? Um, you can Google that online. Uh, no preferences. What's that? No preference for companies. No, I don't have a preference for companies. I think when I, I wish I knew the name of the one that I pr purchased. Um, I can get the link though. Um, okay. I just, I recommend calling the company and doing some research on and asking them questions. Um, one thing that's uh, really difficult with them is read reviews because it is an oxidizer. Mm -hmm. So if the machine has a lot of metal in it, they can break down easier. So you just want to do, you know, look at those things and, um, you know, ask questions when you're purchasing. Does it require distilled water? No. Okay. It's just, so it's, HO, it's H2O and then NaCl because it's sodium salt. So when the two react, that's where you get the hypochlorous acid. And yeah, we you have excess minerals in our water here. Yeah. Um, I would go by the manufacturer's recommendations for that. Okay. Um, excellent, excellent. Um, like, great model. Presentation. And, yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. uh, through the chat function, uh, what's the name of the filter you can purchase at Costco, Becky? It's Winix. W-I-N-I-X. And you can, you can buy that one other places. I just know that you can get it at Costco. Wonderful. Uh, okay. And then we have... Uh, James Griffin, I'm going to allow to talk. James, can you hear us? Maybe. James, you're allowed to talk. You have to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question. Nope, no question. We're trying on my side. Nope. So is we, this presentation uh, going to be available? Um, should I refer another uh, co-worker to it? 
Uh, we will have a, sorry, go ahead, Becky. Oh, I didn't hear, go ahead. I would like, my other coworkers would probably love to watch this. So I didn't know if it was gonna be um, on a video they could watch at another time. Uh, at this point, uh, with our continuing education programs, they will not be available to anybody outside of those who have participated in the CE. Uh, we're working on that function moving forward. Um, so please stay tuned. Thank you. If I can help answer any questions for you or your staff members, you can always just message me on my Ergo Finger USA um, website, and I'll, I'll be happy to help you if you have questions there. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, we've got uh, for the fogger. Do I need two hundred ppm or eight hundred ppm? I think that all is based on depending on what fogger you have. So I think I would refer back to the manufacturer's recommendations for that. So I think that they give guidelines for that. Wonderful. And Jerry, uh, who sells the LM134 and 135, Planmecca sells that uh, in the chat. There is a link to the shop.planmeccausa.com website. Uh, you can also purchase through Henry Schein, Patterson Dental, and Atlanta Dental, and other NBC dealers. The amazing instrument. Amazing. Have you? Our employer is setting up the um, machines he uses to evacuate when he's doing um, his composite and he's mm -hmm. creating, working with the powders. I forgot the name of it. Airflow? It's, pardon? Airflow for um, stain removal and... It's when he does air abrasion. He has a large machine that he, he says clears the room in four minutes. Mm -hmm. okay, and so it it's suctions probably... out the, all the air abrasion materials and um, yeah. Yeah, um, they do have those external suction devices. Um, so everyone's different. I've seen about four or five different models of it. And mm -hmm. so if they are using the high speed or the air abrasion. You know, it's a great option. Okay, yeah. They use them routinely in Japan, actually. There's a lot of offices that have them built into the clinics. Okay, he supplied each hygienist with a unit. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, wonderful. For those of you who are still on, uh, we'll keep it open for a few more minutes for questions. Please note when you create an account at the uh, Plan Mecca website, again, uh, shop.planmeccausa.com. When you create an account, you'll get a 20% uh, off coupon for LM Instruments. Uh, here we go, a couple more questions. If there is not PPE to change between patients, is it safe to work? We're having a hard time getting gowns and caps and N95 or level three masks to change between every patient. Yeah. Um... The reason we switched to the non-disposable gowns was because the, the disposable gowns are actually very difficult to find. One thing you might want to look at is some of the manufacturers recommend that you can autoclave them. Some of them can be autoclaved up to five times. So check with that before you start throwing them away. Um, as far as reusing the N95 masks, um, using the UV light to sterilize them, that really increases the amount of times you can use your N95, but there is a limit. I think it's like 10 times that you're supposed to be able to use the UV light on them. Um, as far as the level three masks, there are some hygienists that I know are using cloth masks over top of the N95s. And the whole point of the, the surgical mask over the N95 is just to prevent um, the amount of uh, soiled material touching the N95, just to increase the longevity of using it. So I know it's really hard to um, find these items, just like the nurses that were on the front line, you know, we just have to do the best that we can for, the, for what we've been given. Um, and try to limit the amount of cross-contamination and try to limit um, exposing ourselves to the, to the virus. Wonderful. Uh, how many times, Max, can you use an N95 slash KN95? 
uh, according to CDC recommendations, maybe five, but after sterilizing under UV light, uh, can you still use four or five times? Um, I have to be honest, I'm not sure, but I know that they have said, I have read somewhere that you can UV light sterilize them 10 times. Um, so, you know, UV light does have its limitations because if it's not able to penetrate the material all the way, it may not completely sterilize it. Um, so, yeah, I would say kind of base it on maybe not the quality of using that N95. You have to remember that when you're using, like I said earlier, the straps on those N95 and then you're putting it under UV red, uh, light, that's going to decrease the effective and the strength of that strap. So you're going to notice that the um, amount of protection you're going to get is going to decrease. And then you're going to also notice that the more you sterilize it, the breathing quality is going to go down even more. So I think that's a good judge of deciding when it's time to let that mask go. Wonderful. Um, Becky, what is your opinion of a laser like the Epic Hygiene Unit? Mm. I'm not necessarily familiar with the laser epic hygiene unit. Is that more like a, a, the curatage, like um, using it to manage um, like LBR and that type of thing? Is that what she's asking? Um, what was it? Uh, Jerry, I'm going to allow you to talk if you'd like to chime in. You are now uh, live. Yeah, it's a hi. Um, it's sold by. Um, you know, biolays, and they claim it's a great instrument to uh, do scaling with uh, minimal aerosol production. That's all. Sounds like I need to do more research. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. We I'm. Don't have the, we don't have the perspective there, so um, happy to message offline, and we can connect you with a resource there if you would like. Has anyone looked into the use of ozone to um, use on the mask at the end of the day or at lunch? Um, you know, from what I've understood is ozone can be kind of um, not safe. And so yeah, you can't be in the room, but you could put the masks in a bag, turn it on, go to lunch. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I didn't even research a whole lot in that. What I did research and I found out just it being so unsafe, I yeah. to recommend. And that's it's why- like the UV light. You have to protect your eyes. You don't stay in the room with it. Yeah. Yeah, ozone, you know, and the other thing about ozone is when you use it, the smell is pretty strong. Um, ozone is, you're gonna really need something to clear the room out once you've used it because even with my UV light, when I walk in the room, the smell is pretty strong of burnt material. So, I, it smells like rain, that smell you get yeah. when it rains. Yeah. Especially if there's a lightning storm. <laughs> yeah, I don't... Um, don't have any information on it. That's okay. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, a couple more here uh, from Karen. Silly question. I don't, I don't leave the house without lipstick, so good for you, Karen. Um, does the sterilizer remove the stains? The sterilizer, which one? Like the UV light? Yeah. Will it remove the lipstick stains? The UV light just kills. That's it. Even it just kills in the air. It doesn't even remove um, uh, the particles once it's killed the virus. And so it's not going to um, remove stains off of your mask. And I can be the first one to say, I don't leave the house without makeup either. So my masks are stained. Everybody knows which one is mine. So. Okay, so no, no stain removal. Um, from Larissa, what pre-rinse and post-rinse do you give to your patients, Becky? Um, I don't do a post-rinse, but I do a pre-rinse. When we first started this, we were using um, peroxide and periocyance, but we've recently switched to peroxyl. Um, and that's a, I think it's made by Crest and you can buy it pretty much anywhere. So it just prevents, it just is quicker. I don't have to mix two things and it's um, high in uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide. So it has the oxidation effects. Okay, wonderful. Uh, from Latiza with the uh, Ecolox Tech, 
how many times, I'm sorry, it jumped on me. How many times do you need to run to have 800 ppm? You just got it and instructions are not clear. Ecolux Tech. Ecolux, Ecolux Tech. Oh, the, um, is that the, I'm sorry, the hypochlorous acid um, producer? If you think you're still on, I'm gonna allow you to talk so you can offer clarity if that's okay. Yeah. Matiza, can you hear me? I think that's the hypochlorous. I would call, if you're not clear on the instructions, I would definitely call. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, yeah, I hope I pronounced your name okay. Uh, Leticia. Can you, yeah, can you clarify your question for us, please? Yeah, I just got the Ecolax tech to make the, the HOCL. Mm -hmm. And uh, even with instructions, it's not clear for me. To put it in the fogger, uh, how many times do I need to run to have like 800? Or if I want to use it in my kitchen, how many times I, I need to run it to have like 200 ppm? You know, uh, like I said, I would refer to the manufacturer. I, I can't say specifically for those. Um, I haven't gotten mine yet. So for me, I haven't, I haven't used it yet either. Um, so I would maybe call the manufacturer if you can have them clarify that for you. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, not sure. I'm not sure. Okay, I call the manufacturer. Thank, thank you so much, Becky. Thank you. Uh, from Greg, uh, a couple questions here. Do you feel it's worth purchasing an extra oral suction because they are large and expensive? Second, uh, what's the best place to put your HEPA filter in the operatory? Um, I, the HEPA filter is making sure it's just not behind you. So I like to put it right next to me in my operatory so it can draw as much air away from us and be as close as it can to draw the air away. Um, you can also put it at the foot of the patient so it's pulling it away. But the reason I don't like to do that is because you're moving the air further. And so the less you can be moving that air from the concentrated area to the air filter, in my opinion, is the best way to do it. And they recommend, you know, putting it next to you just as long as it's not behind you. So you're not pulling that air behind you. Yeah. And is it worth it to purchase an extra oral suction? Well, <sighs> I don't know. I think it's your preference. You know, do you want to have another device there or do you have other devices that are there that can help you like the high volume evacuation? It's going to give you, you know, more hands because you're obviously not holding it. It's going to give you the ability to, you know, have it right there. Um, I think that would be personal preference. I would rather not and control it other ways. Um, you know, like using my HVAC and then using a HEPA filter um, and my UV light sterilizing my room. But I'm very blessed in the fact that I live, I have an isolation room. I have, my rooms are isolated and I can switch between two. So. Okay, wonderful. Let's see here. Uh, I think we've covered everything that's public. If there's anything else. We'll give it a few more minutes uh, again, uh, shop.planmeca.com or shop.planmecausa.com for LM Instruments uh, and or your uh, Planmeca distribution company. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be in front of you today. Um, stay safe, Karen. Thank you for the uh, commentary through the conversation today. It's been fantastic. Uh, Friday night, date night. Yeah. <laughs> Once uh, in a couple months, we'll talk about Friday night, date night. How about that? Yeah. Uh, we got one more. Here we go. You've mentioned on saving time, putting on PPE. Uh, example, keeping your N95 on, uh, okay. safety glasses. Do you keep your face shield on? If so, do you wipe it with disinfectant? It was hard to hear during that point. Something about um, and Nibal, uh, hopefully Nibal. Yeah. I'm happy to open you up if you'd like, just uh, right back in the question and answer if I'm not expressing your question right. Sounds like, are you wiping your face shield with disinfectant? Yes, I do. Um, you can do it with disinfectant. And if you're, I, I use the spray, like the Cavicide spray. And what I do is I spray it 
both the inside and the outside and I um, wipe off my counter, place a paper towel and then place my, my shield on that and I let it sit. Because remember we have to have contact time for up to two to three minutes for those um, disinfectants to work. Yeah, so I do wipe them and it does make them smeared and it does make them um, harder to see through and I just replace it if I'm having issues, so. Okay, wonderful. All right. I'm gonna uh, post one more time. Uh, a couple of people are asking for the um, CE details. Uh, you will see it in the chat function, a link as well as the AGD code for CE for this webinar. Any other questions for Becky? Well, thank you so much, you guys, for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, like I said, if you guys have any more questions, you can find me on Facebook, um, and I'm happy to answer things. If you have questions even about the LM instruments, if you're kind of wondering which one is the right one for you, um, I have several different kits. I have scale and root planning kits, and I have my maintenance kits. They're a little bit different. Um, so if you have questions about that, or if I can help you with your PPE, or um, understanding some of the other things that I talked about, you know, all I do is, if I can't answer, I research it. And so, um, I'd be happy to help if you guys need help with something. That's wonderful. Becky, you've been great. We've got one more person to raise their hand. Deborah is allowed to talk. If you'd like to unmute yourself, uh, and then we will move on to Friday evening. Deborah, can you hear us? Maybe not. Happy Friday, everybody. Be safe. Be happy. Hope you have a fantastic weekend. Becky, thank you for joining us. It's been amazing. Thank you so much.